and so we begin by setting our motivation to uh, do whatever we possibly can to attain the peerless state of enlightenment and uh, with the knowledge that in order to attain that state I must uh, perfect all the trainings on the Bodhisattva path and to perfect those trainings in turn I need to have a thorough understanding of them based on an unmistaken presentation. Uh, with this in mind, I have arrived here this morning to listen to an outline or brief explanation on the, on the outlines of the great treatise on the path to enlightenment as composed by the great Lama Tsongkhapa. ลาบะนะจ๊ะซัมเดย์ของพวกเดคอมบาลิชูเบตาซัมเดย์จะได้ตัวเวสิจิตาจะวัดได้ตัวตัวเอาตาแต่บ่ซัมเดย์ของพว
So this uh, is kind of reflecting on uh, the benefits on the one hand and on the disadvantages or faults on the other is a process that we engage in continuously again and again and again. On the one hand, uh, looking at the benefits of meditative stabilization in order to generate a sense of um, eagerness and delight uh, in uh, for the development of that sort of habit of, of engaging in uh, more and more refined, more and more stable uh, meditative concentration uh, by seeing uh, the benefits, uh, the good side of that. And on the other hand, uh, familiarizing ourselves to with uh, what are the consequences of not uh, meditating or developing or cultivating meditative stabilization, um, uh, namely a distracted uh, uh, mind, a distracted mind which is therefore not controlled, therefore going to uh, in engage in a non-virtuous uh, 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 activity which will lead uh, to negative, negative imprints that will keep us uh, mired in cyclic existence continuously, for example. Tingetsa and so the, the basic uh, premise uh, around the development of meditative stabilization, which in, in the term really involves both uh, the uh, development of uh, mental serenity or quiescence and uh, insight. And uh, the, the, the kind of premise is through the reduction of distraction, in other words, through uh, the process whereby we uh, resist the dissipation of our attention, dissipation of our mind, and thereby uh, gather the forces of our mind in, into a more controlled focus, uh, that uh, automatically uh, reduces our tendency to become distracted to outer objects and therefore will not uh, engage in uh, non-virtue. So the very kind of mechanics of concentration itself is helping us to uh, avoid <coughs> non-virtue. <coughs> ラシンジカトナプチバチ。だから、そのうちで、天がつらとなくらまちばち。あれ、いいんでちね。いいんでちね。だから、じゃあ、次、かそれだ。次、もちのコアコティア。テザマセ。あれ、次、天がつらとな
aspect of developing meditative stabilization, finding ourselves uh, distracted uh, in cyclic ex existence and continuously uh, collecting the causes to remain so in cyclic existence. Uh, even if uh, we have aspirations to attain uh, higher rebirths uh, in the form or formless realms, uh, without paying attention to meditative stabilization, of course, we will not accumulate uh, the causes that could lead to even that uh, kind of temporary result. So we can see if, if it is essential um, to attain rebirth in the higher realms to uh, develop meditative stabilization, then it goes without saying and that uh, meditative stabilization is absolutely indispensable to the attainment of liberation or the omniscient state of enlightenment. And so in this regard, when we talk about uh, the how to enter into the practice through uh, contemplating on the benefits of and the disadvantages of not uh, developing meditative stabilization, it's done in this kind of context. <laughs> Covered Chicago, <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, this being the case and uh, through our uh, development of a sense of uh, enthusiasm for and delight in the prospect of uh, meditative stabilization, uh, we should therefore uh, really take uh, every uh, uh, opportunity available to us uh, to uh, develop that sense of meditative uh, serenity uh, and to uh, not wait for everything to be perfect, but rather see what we have now to habituate ourselves to that uh, 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 development, uh, even a little at a time, and then what do what we can do with the opportunity that's available to us, and then really aspire to creating a better uh, conditions, better opportunity uh, to be more concentrated in our efforts, but to make sure that we don't kind of put it on the long finger all the time, but to use the conditions we have that are available to us to try to habituate in some uh, sense. And we'll see that uh, that meditative concentration improves uh, little by little by little, uh, but in, in a steady way. <laughs> Cassodata,对面了,给什么,给什么,给什么,给什么,给什么,给什么,给什么,给什么,给什么,给什么,给什么,给什么,给什么,给什么,给什么,给什么,给什么,给什么,给什么,给什么,给什么,给什么,给什
这个是个人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的
So we, we can see, uh, in some sense, like a, the, the hint of what it would mean to really cultivate a med meditative stabilization as it is described here. Because even in, uh, in our normal uh, world, in the normal state of things, that we can see that if one has some sort of stability of mind, uh, that uh, leads to kind of much more happiness uh, for that person. Uh, it's much more c uh, consistency in, in their mood, in their uh, responses to uh, life, etc. And that, um, on the other hand, uh, we can see that those who haven't got any uh, stability of mind where it's kind of like extremely fickle there's like momently momentary delight and then uh, momentary depression or dejection uh, that uh, that's kind of the mind is in no way has no kind of defense against the uh, reactions that are going to happen due to outer circumstances and that's a very like really distracted more uh, more uh, first and foremost but uh, not a very stable or very satisfactory kind of mind to be living with. And so you can see even in that sense, in the mundane sense, uh, any more stability we can bring to our mental processes is going to uh, defend <coughs> against uh, unhappiness and lead to more uh, happiness, more um, uh, satisfaction. And not only that, but of course, that with the stability of mind, we have uh, the process through which we can use uh, reasoning and when that's uh, uh, combined, we can see that there's much more chance of seeing uh, the reality of any given situation and being able to take uh, skillful action uh, in response to it. So that's kind of the potential that's there. Uh, we can then imagine what it would like to be actual to achieve the kind of skill and, uh, and precision that's with, uh, that comes with meditative stabilization as described here. Uh, where we have complete control uh, over where to place our attention, uh, how long we want to keep that attention there, and uh, we are not distracted. And so with that sort of freedom uh, of, of mind, the, there's, you can see what kind of potential uh, it would have. <coughs> So with the, uh, an attitude that is so fickle whereby uh, one is uh, delighted when uh, someone says you know, you're a good person and then one is dejected when someone says you're a bad person actually uh, is a description of a person who has really no independence not no control, no independence at all to define themselves. It's completely dependent upon, uh, you know, external uh, judgments, and the reacting accordingly. Uh, so, where somebody who has a sense of uh, stability of mind, a meditative stabilization, is not uh, uh, prone to reacting in that way, uh, they have uh, independence. They have uh, freedom. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so again, that's not talking about like freedom in the sense of uh, kind of a nation, national or nationhood uh, freedom, yeah. but that's a it's a question really of gaining personal uh, freedom. That's what's uh, that's very important. And and 
It's interesting to note that uh, you know the uh, sort of um, the way of being in the desire realm, uh, our our realm, is uh, and. If, if we look at the, the way that the world has uh, uh, developed, uh, especially in the last several hundred years, that the external uh, facilities, external conditions have uh, improved uh, out of sight, really. And uh, but uh, at the same time, it seems to be almost uh, accompanied by uh, a commensurate increase in mental uh, problems and uh, mental unhappiness and mental difficulty and mental instability etc and so it's a, it's a, it's interesting that this is the, is the case so that uh, people now even though we're living in like first world conditions or uh, that the, the, the standard of living has increased so much yet uh, that people are more likely to be uh, uh, unsettled and um, and find unbearable, even very minor uh, problems. Uh, you know, they they are really kind of like thrown by even kind of minor incidents. So that this this kind of um, almost an extra mental instability that comes with uh, uh, a better standard of living. Strangely enough, so that the, the again it points to the to the 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 the, uh, the fact that happiness. Uh, is something that arises from within, that it's a, a mental uh, job, an inside job, and it doesn't uh, depend on what one's external circumstances are. I'm <laughs> So the extent uh, of a problem uh, is often related to the, the extent to which we know uh, the actuality of the situation uh, from which that problem has, uh, has arisen. And if we uh, are unaware of that, are unable to uh, analyze that, then uh, uh, that regardless of the extent of the problem, uh, that we uh, immediately or very quickly fall into this sort of self-cherishing uh, quagmire, where it's kind of like, oh, why me? Why should this be happening uh, to me? It's not fair, and so on. And that uh, this is, again, not a recipe for one's own personal uh, happiness. So it's so important for us to, uh, to understand the reality of the situation and that uh, and the, the degree to which we are aware of that, to see the kind of bigger picture in, in a way. Uh, to that degree, we are uh, capable or have the potential to find a solution uh, to that particular problem and to eradicate it. The, uh, so therefore, uh, this aspect of really looking into uh, the importance of uh, meditative stabilization uh, is really important to see the uh, advantages of and disadvantages of not having it. Uh, the third uh, outline here, we're looking at the divisions of meditative stabilization. And here, uh, there are two uh, categories, uh, divisions in relation to the nature of meditative stabilization, namely uh, a mundane and a super mundane a meditative stabilization. 
chicken but the chicken let there was that need and order Casonata can judge a come go my key tap in a sum name come here come go so gum the sumer come here get up there's some key again you to be a teacher to that take you to be again something come here or that did what that did a chicken casual ちてんちてんかそれちてんてちてんかそれちてんてちてんてちてんてちてんてちてんてちてんてちてんてちてんてちてんてちてんてちてんてちてんてちてんてちてんてちてんてちてんてちてんてちてんてちてんてちてんて
So terms such as cyclic existence and liberation uh, are used by uh, Hindu uh, schools also Jain also Jain. and Jain also uh, use these kinds of terms. Uh, however, what they mean by them uh, is different to how they are presented in Buddhism. So, for example, that the, uh, the idea that uh, cyclic existence uh, is synonymous with the uh, continuous uh, taking on uh, of uh, a set of contaminated, appropriated uh, aggregates uh, from rebirth to rebirth to rebirth, as presented in Buddhism, is uh, not uh, that which is uh, uh, which is kind of this is not the way it's defined in uh, Hinduism or, or Jainism. So that this is uh, absolutely crucial because uh, this is considered to be like the key uh, issue uh, to deal with in, in terms of gaining liberation from a psychic existence. And uh, to, uh, like to uh, and, and it's said from the Buddhist point of view, without that understanding, then when one can talk of liberation and uh, liberation from a psychic existence, but it is talking about something uh, different. So from the Buddhist point of view, we look into the, the karma, uh, that is uh, laid down on the mind stream by the three poisonous minds of attachment, aversion, and ignorance. And in particular, uh, that ignorance which grasps at the true existence of a self entity. Uh, when uh, th that is looked into, and we're talking about uh, gaining uh, an, an, a realization uh, of a, a self, uh, uh, of being empty of existing in that way, uh, when uh, the, that point is, uh, is, is kind of introduced in terms uh, in the context of Hinduism or Jainism, uh, they conclude that that uh, automatically means an eradication of self, uh, like a, a nihilistic uh, point of view. Uh, that is, is uh, unacceptable. And so uh, they don't have uh, that st sense of... Uh, uh, of being able to uh, speak about the lack of inherent existence of a self uh, and that not being synonymous with uh, lack of self. So uh, this then, without that understanding, 
then one will not uh, be inclined to propose a path uh, of wisdom, for example, to gain uh, a realization uh, of that directly, uh, because that's what leads to liberation. Therefore, uh, their uh, terminology may uh, be similar, but their meaning behind that terminology is, is different. And so uh, here, uh, you know, the the paths kind of uh, are still together or in common in terms of uh, meditative stabilization is laying down causes to attain uh, higher rebirths or sorry higher realms in uh, uh, the form and the formless realm and, but uh, uh, when it comes to uh, meditative stabilization laying down the causes to uh, gain a direct uh, realization of emptiness for example uh, that's where the Buddhist and non-Buddhist paths diverge uh, that uh, the the Buddhist paths have uh, meditative stabilizations uh, that lead to that. They are called uh, uncommon uh, meditative stabilizations because they're exclusive to uh, Buddhism. And of course, the uh, other traditions don't have those uh, teachings. <laughs> Nampenjulah Sempsampo, so this is, of course, a, uh, speaking to that which is established in the different tenet systems of uh, these uh, different schools of thought, uh, and that. But even within uh, Buddhism uh, as well, there are uh, different positions, different tenet positions, uh, that are held uh, by the different uh, schools of thought within Buddhism. Um, um, different. Uh, uh, assertions uh, in relation to uh, the whole concept of emptiness, uh, both more coarse and then uh, more subtle. And so, for example, even within what are known as the, the middle way view or the Majjhimaka view, uh, you have uh, the uh, autonomous uh, uh, middle way uh, point of view, uh, which uh, asserts that uh, not all present, uh, uh, sorry, that um, that sort of phenomena, because uh, um, uh, rang, rangi sinig mantra. So when that's that So that's uh, yeah. From the autonomous Majjhimika point of view or middle way point of view, uh, they assert that phenomena must actually be established in terms of their own characteristics, and. Uh, and so this is sort of like they would agree that the phenomena lack any true existence or any inherent existence or any objective existence, but uh, phenomena still are established in terms of their own characteristics. So this is a point of difference uh, that uh, is within the Imagimika point of view. Uh, from the, say, uh, mind-only point of view, uh, they assert that uh, the, in, in that phenomena truly exist. Uh, so these... Uh, uh, different uh, tenet positions that are taken up, uh, points of discourse, uh, from the uh, from the 
prasangika or consequentialist middle way point of view. Uh, they would regard uh, all of these uh, definitions or statements, whether it's from their own characteristics or, or truly existent or objectively existent, that they all uh, lack any uh, true existence, that they're all syn synonymous. So a phenomena lacks any inherent existence, covers all of those from the point of view of the prasangika or, or consequential uh, point of view. And so they would uh, view the, the, the kind of say, point uh, in, in a nutshell, looking at why we have the reality we have, is that uh, we uh, believe uh, that phenomena uh, exist in the way that they appear to us as being uh, inherently existent, or whatever you like, truly existent and so on. And that uh, because of that sort of adherence to the appearance, uh, we kind of have, uh, we buy into uh, that reality, and therefore from that, uh, uh, attachment arises to what we like and aversion arises for what we uh, dislike. And on the basis of that, then we're into the mental afflictions, uh, then we accumulate non-virtues uh, on the basis of attachment and aversion and that are laid down on the, the mind and that lead to our, a further continuous and abiding uh, rebirth in cyclic existence. <laughs> Don't ตาเป็นตาการสาธิวัสดุยอ่ะตักจีรวาจีกันสาตาเป็นนังบะเลเชมบะสุเกตาเป็นนังบะเลเชมบะสุกันสาธิตักบะจีกุรวาวะตานัง
within uh, Buddhism, they would take the uh, the meditation on the absence of those characteristics in the self to be a coarse sense of selflessness, and that uh, and so within uh, some uh, Buddhist practitioners they will practice accordingly according to that understanding have a, a coarse sense of selflessness. So it said that, so it said at, 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 for a, as from a Buddhist point of view, at the very least, uh, one must see uh, the lack of existence of such a self having the characteristics of uh, singularity, uh, permanence, and independence. So that's the, the kind of like the, the minimum uh, that one should see a lack of. Uh, to be counted in within Buddhist uh, tenet systems. Hindu le Hindu pe mangbo Hindu pe kya chhumbo mangbo le ta Hindu na ne ta zo zo de de changjian ba jiba jian ba jie zhang ba wo ta de zhu zhu da chu bu yor le ya zhu da jia chhumbo ta ding zhang wo chu bu yor wa ta ya shi ba ri ka shi ka shi ta ya de de zhang wo zhu da chu bu yor ma le ta ri ka shi ta pe ne jiang bian ba ta jiang bian ba shi ta <laughs> so that's uh, again a saying that within uh, the Hindu, uh, overall Hindu systems, there are many, many different groupings and uh, many different uh, schools and, and different uh, uh, divisions of tenets, etc. So again, as referring to in terms of uh, the more subtle uh, tenet positions and uh, more kind of the richer sort of uh, tenet systems are to be found within uh, schools such as the, uh, the uh, I don't know the, the term Samkhya Samkhya is one Rigpa Jempa these are the Chedrapa again I'm saying with others then like their systems are really uh, much more sort of coarse in terms of uh, they will only pay attention to what they can see and uh, what they can't see, they're uh, no interest in, and so on. So it's very much a more modern scientific so it also must be um, pointed out that the, the, the connection, the relationship between what are the tenet systems as uh, formulated and propounded by Shakyamuni Buddha 2,600 years ago and uh, the, uh, the Hindu tenet systems uh, that were already extant in India at the time. And that, uh, so there's sort of a, a debt to be paid to those, the profundity and the depth of those Hindu tenet systems that allowed for uh, their deepening and their kind of more expansive uh, understanding to be uh, uh, divulged by uh, Shakyamuni Buddha. So we can see that uh, to, um, it, it's because it's difficult to imagine how uh, tenet systems uh, more subtle uh, could not be built upon uh, the tenet systems that were already there in India at the time. It's also true uh, that uh, the systems that the Buddha was uh, expounding uh, that uh, that were that much more subtle uh, required an audience that was already uh, kind of versed in the subtlety of uh, the previous Hindu systems as well uh, that was a, they would not have been as receptive uh, to uh, what the Buddha was teaching had they not had 
the kind of history of great thought within India beforehand. <laughs> so again, I said it would have been a different story if uh, the Buddha had appeared in the Stone Age, but it wouldn't be very beneficial to <laughs> they wouldn't be able to get it. <laughs> I think overall uh, that uh, an understanding of um, spiritual traditions in terms of really looking into uh, their tenet viewpoints, uh, the practice that arises from the understanding of those uh, tenet viewpoints and uh, the results that are proposed as the result of uh, genuine practice. Uh, these aspects are very important to actually understand within any uh, spiritual tradition. Uh, so it's not only do they uh, lead to uh, more respect uh, uh, and appreciation uh, of those traditions, but also uh, they would bring uh, like some benefit to one's own practice also. <laughs> So it's like enough like just to kind of refine one's kind of like a response as some sort of, you know, I go for refuge, I go for refuge, but rather uh, to really uh, exercise uh, one's in intelligence and it, it really needs uh, that exercise of reasoning and analysis uh, to uh, in in our response to any spiritual tradition to okay look at the results uh, that are proposed and to ask are they realistic are they likely on the basis of of the practices that are proposed on the views uh, that are propounded and to uh, to see do like uh, are the causes in harmony are they harmonious with the results are the results harmonious with what the causes are and so that that does require some subtle uh, analysis using our own intelligence but it's uh, very vital really Tell and so with regard to looking into you know different um, systems and uh, spiritual systems of course also we uh, pay respect to uh, the different uh, many teachers uh, of those systems and how uh, you know so many uh, great teachers have, have have brought such extraordinary benefit uh, over the millennia uh, in in different ways different uh, cir circumstances and so to kind of really have an understanding that they have a, they appealed to you know the particular uh, personalities and, and dispositions of followers at that time 
and as a result uh, brought a tremendous uh, benefit. And so within in them, when we examine our own teacher, Shakyamuni Buddha, we can understand just how extraordinary uh, the Buddha and exceptional uh, Buddha Shakyamuni was uh, as well. And the more we gain uh, an appreciation of, uh, of, of the teachings of the Buddha, the more we can feel how fortunate I am uh, to have really uh, met uh, these teachings, uh, to have access uh, to these teachings. And that in turn uh, should lead to uh, a kind of a, a resolution not to waste any time but to put these uh, teachings into practice. And to really kind of understand the kind of like what really singles uh, Shakyamuni Buddha out, uh, apart from all the, the, the great qualities of all the great teachers that we might examine and all the varied uh, teachings that have been given, but it's the, it's the concept or the, the doctrine on you know, selflessness, uh, which the, the Buddha pointed out, which really sets uh, him apart. It's really kind of really exclusive. Uh, that's uh, the that, that whole notion that, uh, that absolutely, you know, uh, everything is empty of having uh, a self-entity. It's really amazing. <coughs> so we're looking at the divisions of meditative stabilization, having covered uh, the division in terms of uh, the nature of meditative, the meditative stabilization being uh, mundane, uh, referring to um, meditative stabilization that lays down the causes to be reborn in the form or form or formless realms. And the super mundane uh, meditative stabilizations, which lay down uh, causes to uh, go beyond cyclic existence and attain liberation and uh, the omniscient state of enlightenment. And now the, there's a division in terms of the function as well. So it's discussing uh, the function of meditative stabilization to, in this life, leading to a physical and mental bliss. Uh, that, and a function of, uh, from that uh, to be able to uh, uh, 
realize the kind of qualities are uh, 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 again direct uh, realizations uh, meditative stabilizations that lead to direct qualities or direct realizations or actual uh, qualities another way of putting it and so and then there's a meditative stabilization uh, that works for the benefit of sentient beings so there's different kind of category, different divisions of meditative stabilizations that in terms of uh, gaining what how one progresses uh, on the on the paths uh, uh, through meditative stabilizations is saying that if one has the meditative stabilization as referred to here uh, in the perfection of uh, meditative stabilization one attains what's known as the path of accumulation and one cannot attain the path of accumulation without uh, the attainment of that a particular meditative stabilization and then uh, from that uh, indeed the even gaining from uh, progressing from that to gain liberation uh, from uh, cyclic existence uh, completely um, we need to be able to practice uh, uh, with true uh, uh, sorry uh, on the basis of having attained such a meditative stabilization and so with regard to the first of these the function of uh, producing men mental and physical apply or um, bliss uh, in this life um, refers to actually the generation of mental and physical pliancy and uh, this is simply the kind of a natural result of uh, gaining this control of meditative stabilization at the outset um, it's clear uh, that there is both a mental and physical discomfort uh, if not uh, uh, pain uh, in, in when one sits and so on and trying and the problems of body and mind at the outset but as the mind becomes more refined more focused more concentrated and uh, that uh, not only do, do those uh, particular uh, uh, problems uh, dissolve uh, but one is able to experience a, a mental and physical pliancy which in turn induces uh, a mental a reciprocal mental and physical bliss <laughs> ที่เหลือก็ที่ท่านจึงที่เจอเลยพาพาไปจัดจัดเนี่ยอันนี้มีจริงๆเจอนะท่านจึงมีตรงบ้างเสียตั้งให้ท่านเหลือรู้จีว
and uh, eight uh, adjustments, uh, really antidotes, that counteract uh, those particular faults that one should generate uh, in order to do just that. And, uh, the first of these faults is referred to as, as laziness. And this is the, the laziness as, as has been described of uh, the three different uh, aspects or, or types of laziness. Uh, the first being that of uh, you know the laziness of pro procrastination, where we're, we're putting off uh, what we're meant to do, what we ought to do, uh, constantly finding some excuse not to do uh, something. And then we have the, the laziness of being attached to uh, negative activities, you know, making ourselves so busy with other stuff that we don't get to do our meditation. Our laziness of uh, indolence, of like, and also that sort of defeatism, I can't, why, I, I just can't uh, do it, I'm not good enough and so on. So it's a uh, combination of these kind of mental atti attitudes, all referred to as, as laziness that can be a serious impediment uh, to our uh, de development of meditative stabilization. Lagatilla <coughs> And we can see how pervasive uh, the lazy attitude uh, is in uh, our lives, especially in the, in the modern life, where you know we we are make how how easy it is to make like effort in into a mundane uh, uh, life, twenty four seven. Uh, we're out there making efforts to make money or whatever it is we're engaged in, but when it comes to uh, spiritual practice, we neither have the energy, time, or the inclination to do it, even for for one hour. So it sees that sort of a you know, which is not regarded as laziness in in kind of a worldly terms, but as far as spiritual uh, terms are concerned, that is a, a laziness. Anything that takes us away from a spiritual attitude is is laziness. Anything that's uh, moving us away from being a direct benefit to others or countering our own mental afflictions. Is, is the laziness. <laughs> Because and <laughs> That 
So this describes the laziness of being uh, attracted to or attached to kind of negative, uh, pointless activities. And then the, the laziness of uh, indolence is also that which kind of is a defeatism, where it says, ah, oh, you know, I, I just, I, it's a good idea, but I can't, I can't do it. Uh, I just couldn't. I have such and such a disadvantage, etc., etc. And so you're, uh, really, it's a laziness of the inability to take responsibility uh, for your own spiritual life. And so here, one has to really uh, you know, understand that, that, yes, one wants happiness, but if you do, you have to create the causes uh, to bring about that result. And so we have, it's a real understanding of the cause and effect relationship uh, to really bring about what you really, really want. So it's, it's taking responsibility for your own uh, spiritual life. And in this regard, it's very important to contemplate on death and on precious human rebirth. And to really understand death is definite, the time of death is indefinite, that only one spiritual practice will be any good at the time of death. And in terms of uh, looking at the, uh, the precious human rebirth of our leisures uh, and our endowments, and to see how, uh, how rare uh, that is to have that, how difficult it is uh, to to be able to gain uh, a precious human rebirth and looking into that in terms of uh, difficult in terms of its very nature uh, how, uh, how rare in comparison to all other living beings and so on and then how uh, how in terms of its uh, its causes uh, it's very rare because it's very difficult to lay down uh, causes such as uh, you know uh, very perfect ethical conduct uh, uh, the practice of uh, uh, generosity and the six perfections, etc., and uh, making stainless uh, aspirational prayers directed specifically at a uh, precious human rebirth, to have a combination of all those causes that would lead uh, to uh, this kind of result is very rare, very rare. And then also rare in terms of, of, of uh, by showing how rare it is in terms of the classical example of the, uh, the blind, tur blind turtle uh, deep in the sea, etc. So, uh, to inform uh, oneself of uh, of of just how um, important it is to wake yourself up from this indolent laziness by contemplating how you know time is short, death is coming, uh, and that the only thing that's going to be of value to you at the time of death is your spiritual practice, and that you have all the necessities, all the leisures, the endowments, etc., of a precious human rebirth, fully qualified to go for it now and to really take uh, every uh, take the opportunity that's available to you in order to not waste life but to take the essence of that life Nanamisho Chiwamitawati <coughs> and 
so really, you know, we move uh, from positions of not uh, being aware of or not uh, recognizing uh, concepts such as death and uh, the different aspects of death, you know, death being definite, the time of death being indefinite, etc., uh, to then being exposed uh, to that. And we, we must get used to assimilating that information so that it makes a difference thereafter. What's the difference between your attitude before you were introduced to that and now after you recognize it? It must uh, make a difference in the sense of uh, the same with precious human rebirth. You gain all the different details of what it means to have a precious human rebirth. And, um, uh, and that's the difference between before you knew that and now after you, you have become aware of it, what difference is it playing in your life? What is it, difference is it making in your spiritual uh, life? So it has to be a sense of kind of realizing it uh, to the extent that you are, uh, it's continuously to the fore in your mind and it's informing your actions and, and activities. So it's, it's important to say that this is crucial information, uh, uh, not just a list of facts uh, that we have to know, but it has to make a difference in, uh, in our lives thereafter. So this is, is very, very important to kind of see the importance of, of what's being presented. Um, and to kind of like, um, uh, it said like, for example, death is such that when we, are, we become aware uh, of death in the way that it's meant in the in the teachings uh, that it uh, is good in the beginning is good in the middle and is good at the end in other words it gets us practicing because we realize we have no time to waste and we have uh, we have to take advantage of our opportunity now and that it keeps us uh, practicing uh, on the path and it brings our practice to its uh, completion so that to, to understand death in that to that extent, is some sort of fuel for us right along the path. And so it's not a question of uh, understanding uh, or, or hearing about death and then getting some sort of fright or fear and, and being dominated by that. Uh, that's not the objective. The objective of the teachings on death is to bring to a realization in your mind, not to waste any time, but to take the essence of life now. Untangan I mean, ultimately, the, the, you know, the death teaching is telling us that we, we practice uh, to uh, in, improve and make more subtle and make more piercing uh, our practice uh, throughout our life so that ultimately uh, this death, when it does inevitably come, will be our final uh, death. That would be kind of the ultimate objective, to make it our last death. And so uh, this laziness that's described is one of the five, the first and main of the five uh, faults to uh, the cultivation of meditative stabilization is counteracted uh, by the first uh, four uh, of um, the uh, eight uh, adjustments, namely uh, faith, yearning, perseverance, and the uh, seeing the result of meditative concentration in, in the form of meditative um, suppleness of mind and body. Mm -hmm. 
So faith in this uh, context is referring to having uh, examined uh, meditative concentration and looked at the qualities of meditative concentration. One generates a, a faith in those qualities. And this faith is, uh, in, again, three aspects of the faith of kind of like a clear faith, uh, faith of a conviction in what uh, uh, is being proposed as possible, and uh, a, a manifest uh, faith that one can actually do that oneself. So there we see then once one enters into or once kind of uh, kind of really establishes the seed of faith in that regard, uh, that uh, one's progress in meditative uh, concentration is thereafter tied to uh, the development or the, of the growth of that seed of faith. <laughs> so perhaps yeah, the, the, our difficulties uh, in not having much meditative stabilization is very much tied to our not having much faith. That <laughs> <laughs> And so this uh, sense of faith is, uh, is really building up a sort of evidence bank uh, in, our, in our minds so that we have faith in the, perp in the, in the whole purpose of uh, the effort required to, to go into the meditative concentration. So it's, it's like now, you know, we think of, we think of dollars. We have great faith in the dollar, uh, uh, because we know with with dollars we can buy stuff. It's it's kind of there's a there's a, a very manifest result. You know, I can go to the shop, I can hand over money, and I get stuff on a basis of that. So we see the the qualities of of the dollar. So faith comes naturally. So what we have to do is to see the qualities of uh, liberation and the omniscient state of enlightenment, to really see them as uh, you know desirable qualities to have and that uh, that brings forth this sense of evidence uh, in our minds that convinces us gives us faith in the in in the path and in in particular at uh, this junction in the development of meditative stabilization Right. <laughs> So, you know, it's, it's so important then, like in, in the context of that, where we can become, you know, very much uh, absorbed in the uh, accumulation of, of money, yeah, because we have such faith in that system, um, that debt is like a great counteractor to, to uh, 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 sort of like put a br put, puts the brake on that absorption in a way. And that uh, we have to... Uh, really keep in mind 
the absolute reality of debt that it is definite there's no getting away from it and that you know when we die money is absolutely useful to us we cannot bring it with us we bring our negativities and we bring our virtues with us what's left is just this corpse of a, a physical aggregate and that picture should be kind of brought to mind again and again and again so we are very very uh, uh, clear we can see that, that having the reality of death facing us is extremely useful to kind of focusing the mind and getting on with what we should be actually doing and so not getting distracted into uh, you know chasing after money and so on So it's like uh, you know the, the importance of um, of really keeping death uh, in mind, and that uh, and because sort sort of like we don't that we we get ourselves involved in the pointless minutiae of of life where. There's these moments of constant like uh, distance from another, we're kind of creating an unfriendliness uh, around ourselves with jealousy, uh, uh, anger, bitterness, uh, you know, holding uh, grudges and so on with people and that uh, which sort of like can often fill our days, fill our, our time. And so it's like we have completely lost what is really important. Uh, in order to focus the mind on what is important in, in our lives uh, because we are forgetting the fact that we are going to die. So again, it's pointing out like if you had a situation where there were 10 people in a prison cell uh, and they were condemned to be executed at seven o'clock the, the next morning, that the, there's not going to be disputes happening in the cell that night. There's not going to be jealousy or anger or disagreement because these things are now <laughs> completely and utterly irrelevant they're going to be killed in a few hours and they're contemplating how they're going to handle uh, debt so you've got to be able to have that sort of putting uh, everything in its context so debt is happening debt is coming debt is inevitable uh, but in now what should be the most important things you should concentrate on and all the other stuff is kind of should be put in the irrelevant basket so it's very important for us to to kind of have that sense uh, of of overcoming especially that laziness where we are uh, constantly putting off uh, our practice until another time and you know not today 
yeah, not today. No, I get I get to it tomorrow. No, not tomorrow. I I get to it sometime down the line and after that, and say this is this kind of constantly grasping at at at, at kind of permanence, and uh, grasping at permanence is simply opening the door for attachment and aversion uh, to to kind of be for, for us for our attention to be attracted to attachment and aversion. ちょっと出てきてたか。だから、レガチェ、カラサガチェ、カラサンツロード、何もできんせよ。だから、ちょっと出てきてたか。だから、今まだ <laughs> so we really need to uh, have a, that uh, uh, understanding of of death in the here and now. That you know, we think, oh, I wasn't killed this morning. That's uh, you know, I'm alive. We just kind of only kind of. How we, do, we hardly even reflect like that. We don't have a thought like that. Yet, uh, we had like just a prime example of it just uh, a week or two ago when that person went on a rampage in the car in the, in the CBD in Melbourne, you know. So, you know, those people who were killed, they had no thought of their death uh, being absolutely imminent. They went, they went to work, they went to lunch, they came out of lunch, they're dead. No premonition, no thought of it. But that's the way it happens. That's the way it can happen. That's why you say that death is not something that's necessarily distant from us. So we have to have the idea that there is no time uh, to waste. And so it's not to say it's that, that it should happen to others. It's always happening to others, but actually it's inevitable for me. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, it's not, uh, you know, to this purpose of saying, oh, yeah, such and such a person died, uh, someone over there died, someone over there died, and saying, oh, yeah, they hit, that was a good person, or that was a bad person, without any kind of a sense that, uh, you know, that the point, the finger is turning to point at ourselves, you know, that someone will be saying that about us before very long, and that, uh, like, it's like, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of completely oblivious to the fact that our file is coming up, you know, that these files have taken out, this person is dead, this person is dead, but we could be next in, in, the, in the filing cabinet. You know, that our file could be coming out next. So this kind of application is kind of a pile of applications on the desk and like, you know, that, you know, <laughs> that three have been signed, but you're number four. <laughs> <laughs> That's the reality. That's the reality. If you if we really really understood uh, that reality, we would not be wasting time. Oh, so we leave it there uh, today because I have another appointment uh, quite quickly today. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> so the lamb ring uh, dedication prayer from my two collections vast the space, space that I have amassed and working with effort at this practice for a great length of time. May become the chief leading Buddha for all those whose minds wisdom is blinded by ignorance. 
Even if I do not reach the state, may I be held in your loving compassion for all lives and judges. May I find the best of the complete greater paths of the teachings, and may I please all the Buddhas by my practice. Using skillful means drawn by a strong force of compassion, may I clear the darkness from the minds of all beings, but the points of the path as I have discerned them. May I follow Buddha's teachings for a very long time. With my heart going out with great compassion in whatever direction the most precious teachings have not yet spread, or once spread have declined, may I reveal this treasure of happiness and aid. May the minds of those who wish for liberation be granted bounteous peace, and the Buddha's deeds be nourished for a long time. By even this graded past to enlightenment, the duties of the Buddha's doctors conduct of the Buddha's and their children. May all human and non human beings who eliminate adversity and create conducive conditions for practicing the excellent paths. They never be parted in any of their lives from the purest path faced by the Buddhas. And whatever someone makes effort to act in accordance with the tenfold Mahayana virtuous practices, may they always be assisted by the wise ones, and may oceans of prosperity spread everywhere. <coughs> Thank you. 